All right, well, we're at our cornfield here, corn plots, um, third stop for the day. Uh, since 2002, Dr. Do Joel Ransom has been a professor and an extension agronomist with NDSU uh, with an emphasis in small grains and corn. Dr. Ransom works to develop educational programs for farmers and conduct applied agronomic research that addresses production issues in various crops. He develops guides for variety and hybrid selection. He received his PhD in agronomy from the University of Minnesota. That's okay. He speaks fluent in Spanish and elementary French. Oh, I didn't realize I might have to speak some Spanish today. So. Um, all right, so we are looking at corn, and you can see around us there's a lot of corn. And, and probably when I first arrived here in, in North Dakota uh, in 2002, there was probably just a few hybrid trials here on the station. And as you drove into the campus, I'm sure that you saw a lot more uh, cornfields around than you've seen in the past. They're estimating 3.9 million acres are being planted to corn, and that is up 8% from last year, which is a record year. So it's everybody likes to grow corn. And uh, the price, of course, is a, is a wonderful incentive, but we also know that corn is a very productive plant. And uh, as you have probably observed as you've been driving around, we've seen some tremendous growth in this crop in the last couple of weeks. So where are we at this year in our corn development relative to where we would like to be? Well, interestingly, uh, we got a late start, but we're able to catch up substantially. 60% of our crop was planted by the 20th of May. And that, that actually compares to the long-term average of about 60% by the 20th of May. What those statistics don't say, though, is that we had 40% of, of, of all of our corn was planted in a one-week period just prior to that uh, 20th of May. And so we had a lot that went in. And of course, the 40% that we don't talk about in that statistics, we had it trickled in uh, over a pretty prolonged period of time. So there are some fields that are quite late planted. I think on, on the whole, however, we're probably not as behind as we thought we would have been uh, earlier in the spring. And then, of course, we've had some wonderfully wet weather, at least in parts of the state. I don't know how you've been, Carrington. I, I suspect that you've probably been getting about the, the, the amount of rain that, you, that you'd like. But, uh, you know, you don't have to go very far east and even places west where we've had tremendous rainfall. We had a four-inch rainfall event or a couple of uh, events that uh, um, made us think that we ought to be growing rice instead of corn. Uh, and that, I think, has had a pretty significant uh, impact on, on the way the corn crop looks in that part of the state. In general, I think one of the issues earlier on was that we did have this season, you know, we started really w wet in the spring, we went to a period of dry. And that, that's what allowed us to kind of catch up, and then we got, we got back into the wet cycle. And I think we see that there, uh, some of the fields, there's a fair amount of uh, variability in the emergence. And that's one of the things we worry about in corn production. Corn, uh, it probably is more sensitive to plant population than, than any of the other crops that we typically grow in North Dakota. But even more important, uh, perhaps, uh, to getting an optimum stand is to getting uniform emergence. So I just, I just plucked a couple of our plants out that, uh, you know, you can see this one is a little bit behind, maybe one or two leaves behind its neighbors. And this one would probably be in that uh, four to six percent yield loss if you had a number of these in your field. And occasionally we'll see something like this and you say, I don't know what happened. I mean, why this guy waited so long to, to emerge? But that one will basically be what I call a fancy weed because it will not produce an ear. It'll compete with his neighbors, and you paid a lot of money for that seed that uh, actually became a kind of a, a detriment to you. I'm not sure that there's any real easy solutions to getting a uniform emergence other than, you know, a nice seed bed. Hopefully you get good timing uh, in the operations. Uh, seeding depth becomes critical, making sure you get uh, all your seeds into moisture at the same time. But I think that's probably one of the issues that we'll see is going to take a little bit of yield off, uh, our crop in the state and, and of course the water logging that I talked about previously will have another negative impact. <clears throat> we don't see that here. These, these look, this is a really nice looking crop. We're currently in the state about 1,000 to 1,200 growing degree days, corn growing degree days, and that puts us almost in the middle of a 
of our season. You know, an 86-day hybrid will take about 1,080 growing degree days to tassel. And I found a tassel almost coming up to show you that, you know, within 80 growing degree days, and that's probably about four days, we might see our earliest hybrid in this group starting to starting to tassel. Uh, we are running a little bit behind in growing degree days, but not significantly. Not as bad as I thought we would be uh, at the, the start of the year. So I think it bodes well for a good finish if we don't have a, an already cold. Do they, they move in? Any month of the year, I guess, those things will move in. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that uh, we're actually uh, probably not too bad off. I think, in fact, if we look at the growing degree days, uh, from assuming a, a first of May planting date that we're actually 75 growing degree days above normal. So this is a, actually a little warmer season than normal. If you take into the account, account we planted about 20 days late, uh, that, that's going to penalize us 120 growing degree days. Right now we're accumulating about 20 growing degree days a day. So, you know, within four days we could catch up. But remember, those deficits hit us at the end of the season when when we don't accumulate 20 a day, but when we're accumulating five and, t and 10. And so it really means more than that as we're trying to get the crop finished. In fact, the uh, statistics say 12% of uh, the crop should normally be silking at this time. And I think that there's a report of 5%. So we are just a, a wee bit behind there. Okay, what about water? Some of you, anybody concerned about not having enough water for your crop? Yeah, there's a couple of hands. I think that's typical of farmers, right? They just never think they can get enough. Uh, in parts of the state that we are, probably uh, there are there is some concern, particularly in the lighter soils and those that haven't had the kind of rainfall. We came, we finished the year very dry. And in, fa in fact, we during the extension meetings in the winter, I talked a lot about dealing, you know, managing for a drought prone year. And of course, well, maybe that's all I have to do is talk about that and we'll get these kind of rains. But we, we, we really had a very uh, dry profile and, and we were able to catch up with some of those really rain events uh, pretty nicely. But not in every place, not in every case. The, the nice thing about the, the rainfall uh, seasonality that we've had here in Carrington is that it's not been excess. Sometimes when we get the excess period of rainfall, it'll cause the roots to be restricted because they won't grow into soil that doesn't have oxygen. I'm sure in the valley you can probably find a crop about this height and, and go up and pull the plant out without too much difficulty because the roots are stuck right on the top because they haven't been able to get down. Now here it, it takes a, a man stronger than me probably to, to pull up one of these 12 or 15 leaf plants. And so these roots will follow the moisture down. And I, mean, I, I thought some interesting trivia uh, at the 12 leaf stage, and, and I think we're just about at the 12 leaf stage here. Uh, the roots are typically two feet deep. Uh, by silking, they're three feet deep, and they continue to to, to, to go down to the soil uh, up until dent, and well, they'll get to the four foot area. And so, if we have a full profile, we're able to extract that moisture in a season like this, where the roots are getting um, uh, good aeration. And there is moisture for the roots to follow, that they should be able to follow down and get that water. I'm not saying that we don't need another rainfall event, uh, but uh, the, the sequence of, of the rain relative to the, the plant development, I think, bodes well for these crops to be able to ac access what's uh, there in the soil. So what about problems? It doesn't look too bad behind us. Um, this is actually the period where green snap can be problematic. The fact that I mentioned this and that if green snap occurs, don't blame me. But uh, usually two to three weeks before tasseling, or silking I should say, is when the, the crop is most susceptible to green snap. And that has to do with the fact that it's, it's well rooted, well anchored, so it doesn't, the plant itself typically will not move. Uh, I mean the, the roots itself. Then you get a strong wind and you have uh, leaves and, and stock that haven't really lignified until after silking. And so uh, it's very common to, uh, during a high, way, rain, a high wind event from this period up until about silking where you would see a green snap. And it can be very uh, devastating to yield. I know Oaks uh, a couple of years ago had data where, I mean, they basically lost uh, the entire crop due to green snap. So that's something that uh, we hope doesn't happen, but is uh, we are in a sensitive stage to that. 
about the only thing you can do to control that is uh, is certainly you want to when you have opportunity to select a hybrid that will resist green snap select a hybrid i think for example that that year we had that uh, heavy wind in uh, oaks did allow some selection uh, of hybrids for green snap this is also the period for uh, the rootworm feeding uh, rootworm is the most uh, devastating uh, insect of corn. We uh, don't typically have uh, big problems with rootworm because it uh, is the most problematic where you've had continuous corn, usually more than just corn after corn. It's usually corn after corn after corn. That's also a nice thing is if you don't want to use any other management except rotation, it is effective in controlling the rootworm, at least with the variants and the biotypes that we have. So you can get complete control by growing soybean, by, by growing corn after soybean. But we do have a, a, a location in our, near Arthur where uh, uh, very heavy pressure in that. Uh, uh, the, the larva is now at the, the third instar stage and will soon uh, pupate. And uh, so they, they're really now starting to, to chew on the roots. And uh, you can imagine, you know, if you lose your main roots, uh, what impact that's going to have, especially if you have uh, dry conditions coming along or a heavy wind, and you need those graceful roots to keep the plant up. So, recommendation there is uh, rotate, and if you're not rotating and you want to use the BT traits that are available, <coughs> I would say also it's a good idea to rotate the BT traits because we have uh, they have discovered resistance to. Uh, some of the bee treat traits, I think particularly the yield guard trait uh, in parts of Iowa and southern uh, Minnesota. And so to keep those traits viable, I would uh, recommend that you rotate those in your uh, hybrid selection. I think a final point I want to talk about is nitrogen management. Uh, we, we in the valley, of course, have had a lot of nitrogen loss. Most of our nitrogen, maybe. It looks like it. You know, part of it is that we don't have good root systems to get down to what might be there. <laughs> But we do lose nitrogen from either uh, leaching or, in case of the heavy soils in the valleys, probably denitrification. And the question might be, are we able to do a rescue uh, application and, and get our crop back on track? Now, typically, uh, the side dress uh, in the corn belt as a whole, and, and probably here in North Dakota, would be around that seven leaf stage, so earlier, certainly earlier than this stage. We don't like to drive equipment when the corn gets too tall. But the data would suggest that, uh, in fact, there was a study done uh, not too long ago in Indiana where they waited to put all their nitrogen on at the 15 leaf stage, so probably a, about another week older than this. And they got a 100 bushel yield increase. You know, they started with zero to start with. <laughs> but it shows you the capacity of the plant to adapt, to catch up. Uh, with a late application. You can't do that with wheat, I promise you. You know, you can't wait till the boot stage and, and get a get a hundred bush or yield increase. But I think it does mean that for those of you that are serious about corn, there may be those times when you want, want to consider a later season application of nitrogen, whether it's a rescue or whether uh, for whether you didn't get uh, your full amount on uh, before before planting. And there is a nice big window for corn uh, for getting that nitrogen on. The other thing to be mindful of is we do have Goss's wilt, uh, and I don't have any example to show you. Uh, but it uh, is pretty obvious when you get it because basically, you know, you can see that plant down there that's, that's all browned off. Um, you, you're, it's not a small lesion, it tends to be several leaves that are impacted. It's a bacterial disease, it's not controlled by fungicides, so I wouldn't be too excited about putting fungicides on a Goss's wheel field. As far as fungicide use as a whole, a lot of the work you're seeing here is looking at uh, fungicides as an option in corn. Uh, if you look at the diseases, if you look at the leaves here, anybody see any diseases? It's pretty hard to find diseases on corn in North Dakota. But uh, there is, uh, I know, been interest in using it as kind of a plant health type of, uh, of practice. And I think most of our data would suggest that it's probably, you probably save money by not putting it on. But we are continuing that research. And uh, maybe in some years, uh, when you have some, uh, surprisingly for me, last year when we had the serious drought stress that we did, um, although it didn't seem to impact yield quite as much as I thought, that uh, we seem to have uh, more of a response in that year than we would in a year where you would have
without diseases would have been more problematic. But, you know, our current recommendation is probably to save your, your money on, on herbicide, uh, fungicides. I think with that, uh, I will conclude. Any questions? When are we going to harvest? We're all hoping we harvest the 1st of September and we get 250 bushel yields. But uh, in reality, uh, typically in North Dakota, we would start harvest kind of in mid-October. We hope we don't have to harvest until Christmas, but sometimes we do.